More and more we're finding that people are recognizing the importance of nutrition and physical activity in terms of preventative measures for cancer. Um, I don't think that's the way it used to be, but I'm thinking it's moving in that direction. I'm hoping it's moving in that direction. Um, so there obviously was quite a bit of interest. It was good to see how many people were there uh, and how much conversation it stirred up, the discussion of nutrition. So. I'm hopeful that, particularly in terms of prevention of cancer, we're going to start to see this trend. I do think that it's a big player in cancer prevention. I do. I think that lifestyle in general, if we took a little bit more time and, and paid more attention to our lifestyles, our quality of life, our stress levels, um, how much we're moving our bodies and what we put into our bodies, absolutely. I think we would see a big difference in terms of reducing risk for cancer and other chronic diseases. I think that we, are, we have become an incredibly sedentary culture um, the more ways we can find other things to do, our grocery shopping, our vacuuming, our uh, you know, daily tasks, we're finding ways to not move. Um, we're finding ways to make our world more convenient, and that just happens to mean that we're sitting more as a result of that. Um, we're more digitalized, we're on our phones, we're on our iPads, um, and these behaviors tend to be more doable when you're not moving. Um, so certainly physical activity and how much we're moving our body over the course of the day I think is a huge part as well. Um, as I mentioned before, stress. I think stress levels, I think we're a very harried, very uh, stressed culture and we, we're moving so quickly. Um, and I think that is also a burden and potentially a cause of inflammation in our bodies when we're so wound tight and we're so stressed and we're spread so thin. We have so many obligations. Our kids are playing so many sports and involved in so many different activities that quality time for families, family units um, is, is sparse. And some of it has to do with the fact that I think a lot of parents, a lot of families are having to work so hard um, to sustain a family. So it's not necessarily all by choice, but uh, the culture that we live in um, and the demands of the culture that we live in uh, are in, the, in and of themselves creating a lot of stress. So stress, exercise, absolutely nutrition. Um, and, and then of course our environment and what we're doing to our environment and what we're breathing in what we're drinking, all of these things I think play a part in increasing risk. I certainly can't speak outside of my scope of practice in terms of technology and the development of cancer or other diseases, but of course I see and hear a lot of, uh, of my patients or a lot of my clients doing, um, ordering their food online, I'm having their food delivered from grocery stores online, um, not cooking their own food nearly as much because it's so much easier to purchase something using an app. Um, it's so much easier um, having something delivered or having your groceries sent to you, um, convenience foods, all of those things. Technology has allowed us to streamline all of that. Um, and if you think, if we couple that with having a stressed lifestyle, um, then it, it's a perfect, that's a perfect marriage, that's a perfect union of being so fried and exhausted that you can't move to go get your own food. Right, low nutrient quality, high calories. Well, I think that using the word processed foods, there's kind of a continuum. So we have foods that are heavily processed, um, which look very 
uh, unlike the original food source. So we can look at corn and we can look at corn pops or some other kind of uh, very sugary cereal that at one point was corn. Um, so that's, those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum. We can look at maybe a corn tortilla or canned corn, which is going to be a processed food. It's that corn that's been processed a couple of times, but it's going to be less pro processed and still have a little bit more nutrition than that sugary cereal. So I like to kind of flesh out the different types of processed foods. Um, so not all of them are evil, but the more processed a food is, typically the less nutrition it has. Typically the more calories, the more added sugar or more added fat to make it palatable. Um, these foods typically end up being cheaper too. And so for people that don't have a lot of money, uh, these are easy to afford. They have low nutrition, high calories. It's a bad combination. I, I don't think very honest. I think that there are, are nutrition and food trends that exist. And as soon as a manufacturer or food company catches wind of that trend or that fad or that popular nutrient of the year or month, um, they know that people are interested in that and they're going to somehow find a way to either add that to their product. Um, cereals, for example, you'll see some cereals saying that they're high in protein. Well, cereals are mostly grain. They're supposed to be mostly whole grains, carbohydrate, um, fiber. So to see a cereal say that it's high in protein doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, also, sometimes you'll see yogurts that say that they have fiber. And I think <laughs> yogurts aren't supposed to have fiber. They're naturally not fiber containing. Um, but because consumers are saying, oh, I can get my protein and look, I can get my fiber and that's good for me too. That product might sell more than a, a plain yogurt that doesn't have anything fancy on it, that's maybe from a local farm or a smaller farm. Um, so so it's, it's interesting. It's very influential what big companies put on their products. Well, I don't know about checking the products because I think if there was an institution that would check the products, they would find that it has what it says it has. Because if they're adding protein, they probably added some kind of, you know, protein powder or some kind of protein but additive. They could set up rules and say, well, if you're going to put protein on the box, then protein has to be at least 30%. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. And they do have some regulations in terms of saying something is a good source, a high source. Um, so they have, uh, regulations in terms of how good of a source something can be. But to your point, sure, you know, if unless, uh, maybe unless this product is naturally occurring protein source, naturally occurring fiber source, uh, maybe that's something that, that would be really interesting to say, you know, you can't fluff up your product by saying it has this particular nutrient or micronutrient or macronutrient in it um, for it to sell if that's really not uh, organically what that product is. I think that would be fair. I would much rather people consume plant foods if they can't afford organic, that they get those foods in, then they avoid them because they can't afford them. The phytochemicals and phytonutrients that are in these foods are more potent and are more important to me um, than the potential for getting some pesticides. By washing, we can remove some of that. Um, and that's what I hope that people do, is that they don't avoid them because of fear that they're inorganic and therefore more risky to consume. They're more at risk for consuming more processed foods and avoiding phytonutrient-rich whole foods. For the most part, supplements are not necessary. If we are promoting a varied whole food diet, it's not necessary to have supplementation. Um, depending on how restrictive your diet is, if you're a vegan, you're probably not getting enough B12. And that might be a supplement that you want to include. Um, also, vitamin D is a supplement that, depending on the amount of your sun exposure, and hopefully you're using sunscreen, so you're not getting too much sun exposure, but if you're not getting any sun exposure, very limited with sunscreen, or depending on where you live, or how covered up you are, you could be deficient in vitamin D as well. 
well. Um, so we want to make sure people's levels of vitamin D are in the adequate range. Of course, I think it's important what people are, are putting into their bodies during treatment uh, and prior to treatment and after treatment. And I think that fortunately, a lot of institutions have recognized the importance of having dietitians on board to make sure that patients are getting an accurate message. That maintaining a healthy weight, whether we're looking at preventing excess weight loss going through treatment or preventing excess weight gain going through treatment, nutrition matters. And we can do both of those things by eating mostly whole foods, mostly plant-based, and that's what we recommend for whether it's a breast cancer patient or it's a pancreatic or head and neck cancer patient. Those recommendations are gonna be the same. I think that the World Health Organization, uh, their recommendations to reduce red meat consumption is on point with the amount of evidence that we have. Um, so to reduce consumption of red meat, I think is a good idea. Um, and we tell our patients to not eat or to very much limit processed meat. So salami, bologna, um, sausages, uh, just because of the amount of preservatives that are in those meats, uh, amount of sodium that's in those meats, that's believed to be um, at least one of the potential reasons there's increased risk when people consume a lot of those foods. Well, I speak about dairy products the same way that I speak about uh, other maybe meat products is that my preference is people vary their protein sources so they're not getting over consumption or they're not over consuming any one type of protein. Um, I think that doing uh, unsweetened um, and as natural dairy products as possible, if you're going to choose dairy products, is a good idea. So doing the unsweetened, um, less processed sources, they're just like there's a continuum of processed other foods, there's a continuum of processed dairy foods. So you can find a, a local um, plain dairy uh, yogurt or a plain cottage cheese or something like that that still has quite a bit of nutrition in it. Um, and we can find a, a drinkable yogurt that has you know, maybe 10 teaspoons of sugar in it um, and much less protein. So there's still a continuum of quality with a lot of these things, including dairy. So choose a better quality dairy if you are going to eat it. The easiest way to define it is, can you identify what you're eating? Meaning, can you tell me what is in the food that you're eating? So for example, there might be uh, an apple-based or an apple-flavored breakfast bar or energy bar. Uh, and likely, very few people could tell me what all is in that product. There's maybe 15, 20 different ingredients. And so most people would not be able to identify that product. I would argue that's not a whole food. Um, if you were to do an apple um, chopped up in a bowl full of oats that you cooked, put some cinnamon on it, maybe a little bit of honey, you now have an apple-based oat breakfast. Um, but you can identify everything that's in it. That's a whole food. So foods that remain shelf stable for a really long time, packaged foods that remain shelf stable for a long time, typically have a lot of stuff added to them, whether it's trans fats or other preservatives to keep them staying you know, fresh, if you will, um, using that word in quotes, um, for a longer period of time. So less processed foods tend to go bad or tend to spoil more quickly. Um, so based on storing them, an easy way for particularly produce, um, fresh and frozen, fresh and frozen vegetables. Um, frozen are just as good in terms of nutrition. Uh, so to have frozen veg and fruit, if people say I would buy more of this, but it goes bad too quickly, to do the frozen versions, they're just as nutrient rich as the fresh. So that argument goes out the door. <laughs> Thank you.
So I think that's going to be relative. I think it depends on, you know, someone's own personal genetic profile. Um, but to say that uh, doing other things, lifestyle changes are a lost cause, I don't believe that's the case. I think that, you know, cancer is one thing, heart disease, diabetes, uh, other inflammatory diseases, they all can be influenced by our lifestyle by how we eat, by how we move our bodies. And so I do think that lifestyle is an incredibly uh, potent tool. And I don't think blaming this all on our genes is, is a smart idea. I think it's throwing in the towel. Sure, yeah, if we look again at stress levels, you know, what, what paths did they choose that were different in terms of stress, managing stress? Uh, and again, how were they moving their bodies? Um, where did they live? What was their environmental exposure? And what was their nutrition? So CBD oil is what I'm assuming you're referring to. Um, I think there is some really interesting research and interesting connections between that and reducing cancer, risk of cancer. I don't know enough about it to speak about it, but I think to stay tuned, because I think we're gonna get more information and that's going to be uh, become more of an attract attractive option for people. Um, but at this point, I don't know enough about it to speak about it. Start being able to identify more of the food that you're eating. Know what you're putting in your mouth more of the time than you do right now. So wherever you are right now, tomorrow, see if you can incorporate more foods that you can identify, uh, more plant-based foods. Again, if you don't have time uh, and, and your fresh fruits and vegetables are spoiling, your whole grains are spoiling, remember that you can do frozen um, you can keep them in the freezer and they are just as nutritious. So starting there doesn't have to be expensive either. Lean proteins like eggs, um, beans, nut butters, these are all inexpensive ways to move more towards uh, lean proteins. Um, beans, canned beans are inexpensive and a great for, uh, source of protein. So little changes that are inexpensive don't take a lot of time. Little changes can make a big deal, they can add up. It's not true at all. <laughs> it's not true at all. That's what people that love meat say and are terrified of giving up meat. But it's also what people that eat meat say when they don't understand that eating plant-based proteins can actually be very satisfying. So I think they're uh, thinking if they go from, if they stop eating meat, they have to eat salads all day long and they're not gonna have that satisfied, sated feeling. Um, you absolutely can get that from a vegetarian diet. And maybe they don't have to become vegetarian. Maybe it's a matter in terms of improving their health, opting in some plant-based proteins a few times a week. So having uh, a vegetarian evening or two during the week when before it was always meat. Those small changes can be impactful. Find a good recipe for a vegetarian uh, you know, dish or an Indian dish or an Asian dish that has either edamame or has beans or has you know, lentils. These are protein sources and they absolutely uh, amount to protein in your body when you consume them. So it's not that they are that less in terms of quality that they're not going to actually attribute to your, your lean protein. So for children, and I believe also for adults, there's uh, food exposures. You have to give your palate a chance to change and adjust and identify new flavors. So it's doable, it's possible. I think it's probably the same as with children, 12 to 14 food exposures before a new flavor can be understood or appreciated. So they have to try and stick with it. I think so. I think so. I mean, when we look at how the brain responds to eating certain foods, processed foods, really sugary or refined foods, it absolutely lights up our brain. 
um, it affects our dopamine receptors, the receptors that also light up and get excited when we uh, consume drugs. Um, so I, I do believe that um, uh, food addiction or being addicted to certain foods is a thing for some people. And there also maybe is a continuum there as well, that some people are more kind of hooked or are more likely or more prone to, to crave and desire those foods and kind of get hooked on them and rely on them. I'd say high sugar foods processed, really refined sh foods, uh, particularly for somebody that's consuming high amounts of it and high doses of sugar, if they would remove that from their diet, if they're drinking multiple sodas or something like that over the course of the day, for them to remove that from their diet would be a huge impact in terms of their health. So refined sugar, I think, would be my answer. I would say that there's a balance. There's a balance between quality of life and enjoying your life, and I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, I think to live passionately means also eating the food that lights up your taste buds. At the same time, you don't know necessarily how long you're gonna live, and if you end up living two years, five years, 10 years, the if you're eating a very processed or unhealthy diet, if you swing the other way, if you're indulging all of the time, there's likelihood that you will develop chronic disease. And not only is that going to be a taxation on you and your body, but on your family, on the healthcare system. So not only are you responsible for taking care of yourself for yourself, but also for your family and for our culture and our society. Um, so to enjoy the foods that you love and have them and also be responsible and find what foods are healthy and delicious that you love eating. It's both.